this is where we are. And so our responsibility is to reconcile people back to God. That's our responsibility. These are the works of God that we what? Raise the dead, right? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, heal the leper. That's, that's, our, that's our call. Here, reconcile people to God. Well, I don't know what I'm called. The number one question I get at the altar, I just don't know what I'm called to do. So uh, last Wednesday and then Sunday and a little bit tonight, not as much as last week, I'm feeling that word come in the room again. It's, it's John chapter 1. It's also Hebrews 4.12, which is coming in the word. And I, um, uh, Andres, the guy down in Andres Pena, Pastor Pena down in Colombia, as I was releasing this word, he texted us today and he said that's what he wants the conference to be about. When we go down there is to bring that down there and to begin to open that up, the Hebrews 4.12 which is a double-edged sword that the Lord will let you know the thoughts and intents of men's hearts. Because the Lord, it's very important because when you're trying to bring the Lord to somebody, it's very important that you have a tool to get into their heart. And not for you to say, wow, look what I can see, look what I can do, but to say, Lord, what can I be used by you to reach their heart? And your word will get into their heart. There's nothing better. I love prophesying to lost people. I love prophesying to religious people. They're the best. Uh, Charismatic Pentecostals are the hardest. But uh, the, the, uh, the, the, like Catholics, oh, my gosh. I'm in their kitchen within five minutes, literally speaking into their lives because they're not used to that realm. And when the Holy Spirit goes in there, we can touch them in a way and pull them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You know, us, we got to get, we deal with some of our pride issues that, well, I can hear the Lord. I don't need that. And we got to understand that we can receive a word from anybody. You know, I, I love when kids give words, you know. You ever received a word from a kid? Come on. It's powerful, man. They, they, they're so innocent. And they may tell you stuff you don't want to hear, you know, but uh, they'll tell you that. I, Bob Jones told us a story I've shared it before, but. Uh, he released the kids in a conference one time to go prophesy over the audience. And this one little eight-year-old went up to this guy and pointed at him. He says, well, he says, Jesus is here, but he's not here in your heart. And only to find out he was the head deacon of that church. And, and you know, you think, wow, the guy came and told Bob what had happened. He repented. He said, it's absolutely true. I have a head knowledge, but I don't have a heart knowledge. And so that's what we have to have. That's that double-edged sword. That goes in to the intent of your heart. The heart, he didn't have a heart for the Lord. He had a mental assent to God. And so God, through the word, went in and did that. Now, it can be the, the opposite. We can go in and see their, their intentions are good. They're just not doing well. And we just speak to their intentions and ask the, God to activate that in there. Okay, so that's where we are. And I believe we're going to start seeing this more and more. We're going to have these encounters where the Lord, just like Nathaniel, where the ascending and descending, Heaven's coming down. We're getting revelation from heaven, and we're going to begin to release it into the earth in such a way. So, all right, turn to 2 Corinthians 5. We're doing our ministry of reconciliation. I want to read this scripture I haven't read in a couple of weeks. I want you to memorize it eventually uh, of what we're called to do. And because I, this is all Wednesday nights are birthed out of a dream I had. The Lord came to me audibly in a dream and told me what to teach on Wednesdays. And he said that, he wants to heal and cleanse the ministry of reconciliation message. And the message is it's gotten tainted with, with distorted grace and a religious spirit. He told, me, he told me those two things got into the movement. So you have the people who think you can get away with anything and Jesus will take care of you. All right, and others think that if you don't earn it, you can't be taken care of. And it's just not true. You can do nothing and you have done nothing to receive love. I said that last week, Right. There's nothing you can do. Look, I don't care what your title is or what your abilities is. It's not getting you to heaven. I'm sorry. It's not. I remember Miles Monroe was talking about, he was teaching on the kingdom once. I was listening to it. And uh, he needed to get a visa to America. His visa had run out. So he went to the embassy to get his visa. So you have to go to the ambassador, right? The ambassador is the only one that can give you a visa. Uh, there, in the, He's in uh, Bahamia from Bahamas. And so he went in there, and the top guy, he said, at the, at the embassy saw him, and he said, I'll take care of him. So he's here's the top guy. He's the ambassador. And he said, well, this is it. I'm in. I'm in. 
So the guy said, man, I love you. I watch your ministry. I watch every week. I read every book you have. You are amazing. You touch so many lives. He said, you are an amazing man. He said, I just want to honor you. And he said, well, thank you very much. You know, and Miles said, he's getting like, well, I'm getting this visa. And he said, you're just amazing. He said, now, fill out these papers. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter what your title are. title is, you have to have a visa. So it doesn't matter what you do in life. You have to have a visa to heaven. You're not going to get there unless you do the paperwork. And the paperwork is accepting Christ as your Savior and living for him. Amen? <laughs> Jesus dealt a lot of that with the Pharisees, right? He had to. So we've been talking about discipleship. But in this passage here, um, in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, let's go up to verse 16. It says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone in Christ is a new creature, old things pass away and new things, and new things have come. Now, we know that's true, but how many of you know that you still have old things that manifest? So that's not really, it's not saying that stuff goes away. It tells you you've become new. You've got a new set of rules. You've got a new set of guidelines for your life. Old things pass away. In other words, the other ways you were trying to become pure were not working. When you got born again, you have a new way to become pure, and it's through the work of the cross and allowing the work of the cross in your life to, to, to get you to a place where you can be pure before him. So that's, that, to me, is the, is the new things that have come. Now, these things are from Christ who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, I'm, I'm praying God gives me a ministry. You got it. Everybody in this room has that ministry. You do not have to go to seminary, praise God. You don't have to go to Bible college. You don't have to go to Olive. We want you to. But the fact is, you are given a ministry of reconciliation to reconcile people back to Christ because anybody who's not with Christ is not reconciled. You know, if you've ever been a banker or you're, you're we, used to do, we used to do a thing called balancing our checkbook. Uh, anybody, they don't do that anymore. Nobody balances. You do? Oh, brother. Anyway, um, you know, because online we just go see how much money we got, you know, that's what we do. Okay, good. I can have a hamburger tonight. So I go and get it. You know, so, but we used to reconcile our checking account every month. We used to get, we get our bank statement and we'd list it and we'd make sure that everything balanced, that we didn't miswrite a, a number or whatever. So, you know what? Jesus reconciled it. He looked at your account and he says, you're in debt. Your sin has, has deemed you to die and to be damned to hell. So in order to reconcile it, somebody's got to pay your debt. So he reconciles us back to him and makes your account balanced. And so now you're no longer in debt, amen? I agree with that. You're no longer in debt. You don't owe anything. And guess what? It was a jubilee moment because you didn't have the money to pay. You didn't have the, the heavenly fluid or the heavenly uh, revenue to pay. He paid the price, and now you are reconciled. So now, he says, because you're reconciled, you have a ministry to reconcile others the same way. So now you're an ambassador for Christ. That's what he tells us, right? We're an ambassador for Christ, so now we let people come to our embassy. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they need a visa to heaven, and guess what? We're the processing center. They come to us and say, what must I do to be saved? Wouldn't you like that? Somebody walk up to you, what must I, have to, must, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus answered that question. You must be born again. I am telling you that's about to happen. People are about to come up to you in situations and they go, what must I do to have what you have? And it's going to be so simple. You're going to say, man, it's just, all you got to do is repent. And all you have to do is let your life be his. And guess what? Let the cross do the work for you because you can't do it for yourself. And you reconcile them back to the Lord. And now they have a ministry of reconciliation to others. That's what it says. Let's keep reading here. 
And it says, namely, that God in Christ reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our job. You want a job in the ministry, in the kingdom? There it is right there. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, think about that. Every lost person that you ran across today, how many lost people did you run across? Okay. Just go to Walmart. There's a bunch there. I'm, I promise you. The thing people wear in Walmart. You ever notice that? Like, it's like, what the heck? Anyway, that has nothing to do with my sermon. I just, they, they do, they just, some people, I'm like, Lord, did you just crawl out of bed? Anyway, so you see these people every day. Do you hear them groaning? Their spirit is. Can you imagine, I've said this before, could you imagine that you're a spirit from heaven? You've been in the glory realm. You've seen perfection. You've seen the glory. You've seen everything. And then God puts you in a spirit, in a soul, in a body. And you get sent into the earth. And you gotta live, you got to abide in a body that whose soul and body refuse to surrender to the Lord. And they degrade themselves. They take them to sin places. They do open sin all the time. And that spirit has to be there to watch it all and has to be a part of that all. And all that Spirit's doing all the time is looking for light. That's all it's looking for because it was from the light, so therefore it knows the light. So that's why when the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19, when they tried to cast out demons, they said, look, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but we don't know who you are. See, Light knows where light is, and the devil knows when the light's not been activated. And so, therefore, you don't have authority unless your light's been activated. And so, when we activate our light, another regeneration born again, what happens is our light's alive, and now the spirits and the lost people, when they run across us, they groan. Oh! And what are they groaning for? That you would manifest. How many of you manifest? How many of you manifest Jesus? That's a better way. Okay. <laughs> Some of you manifest, and, and they're light, and that lost person says, don't pay attention to that one. Just, just ignore that. Ignore that. That's not the light we're looking for. Think about you. Are you on your best behavior in public? <laughs> Are you letting your light so shine that the world would find you? Hide it under bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, so now we're supposed to do that nice little children's song. <laughs> and we're supposed to live that out in the spirit of reconciliation. And I want you to understand that. If you ask the Lord to do this for you, when you're in a, a lost uh, region, <laughs> which is, since you leave this building, okay, when you, when you get out there, ask the Lord to let you hear the groans. Because it says in, Ma in Romans chapter 8 that they're groaning for you to manifest that you're a son of God. And here you are all bound up and feeling unloved, uncared for by the Lord. You have all these issues that you don't feel like you're a son. And they're groaning for your sonship to manifest. And you're so jacked up with all your unbelief of who you are in Christ that you can't, that the, they're, what they're groaning for, they can't see manifest. 
because you're all about you. And you're forgetting that they are going to hell. And you're all worried that you're not being honored at church or you're not being honored by your friends or you're not giving this platform or that platform. That's where you're jacked up at. And there you are. You're out in a world that's waiting for you to manifest as a son of God. Man. <laughs> we, we, we need some deliverance, don't we? I'm going to call Pastor Brad back. Just get some of that stuff out of you. You all right? I can do it too. We can do it. We have the same authority. But this is where we are. And so our responsibility is to reconcile people back to God. That's our responsibility. These are the works of God that we what? Raise the dead, right? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, heal the leper. That's, that's, our, that's our call. Here, reconcile people to God. Well, I don't know what I'm called. The number one question I get at the altar, I just don't know what I'm called to do. All right. I always remember this minister friend, prophet, he was so tired of people asking him for a word. He said they came up to him after every service. Can you give me, I need a word. I need a word, prophet. You know, he finally got mad one time. He gave a guy, he said, he gave him his Bible, said, here, there's your word. And he said the guy took it and left. It's a brand new Bible. He's really upset. He lost his Bible. <laughs> but, but it's one of these things. It's there. Scott, Pastor Scott taught us Sunday, right, about the Word. And it's right there of what we're supposed to do. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us. We have to walk in the Word and the Spirit, but it's there. And so this reconciliation, I'm going to ask myself to do the same. Now, my problem is in the public. I'm always in a hurry. Are you? You know, especially us men when we go shopping. God, you ladies just wander around the store for hours. You know, we, we know it's the first aisle to the right, right there, left, that, in, out, I'm gone, right? So that's, that's how we do, that's how we do our shopping. God. <laughs> but what about all the lost people I just hurried by? What about, did I hear their groan as I went by? You understand, they know that person's going to hell. They know it. They're, 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 they're the conscience of that person trying to convict them, but the fact is, unless somebody tells them, they're not going to know. Unless somebody manifests the light of God, then they're not going to know there is a light. Okay. The worst they can do is curse you out. It's the worst. I, don't, they, I haven't read any martyrdom in Shreveport recently for sharing the gospel. I, you know, it may happen soon. We're just not there yet, all right? So feel safe. You're not going to have somebody pull a gun on you by sharing the gospel. Did you see that pastor they pulled a gun on? Guy clicked and nothing happened. Come on, Jesus. That's the Lord right there. And he said, he said I was hearing spirits in me to tell, tell me to kill you demons tell them to kill him. And Jesus said, I'll take care of that bullet. <laughs> we used to, our apostle, when he, he passed away, he was my first apostle I worked with. He had these encounters with the Lord and uh, he was in Jerusalem. He was in up in Haifa. He told us a story and he was, uh, he's Armenian, but he was sharing the gospel with some Jews, some, some Orthodox Jews. Well, they got angry. They started picking up stones and they were going to stone him for sharing the gospel. And he just kept sharing the gospel. And he said, the next thing you know, all he, can, he saw the, the Jews had the stones right here. And he said, the next thing you know, he was on the beach in Haifa, down on the Mediterranean by Caesarea. God supernaturally translated him. How about that? You get translated to the beach when they're going to kill you. <laughs> Is that what happened to you? No, all right, all right. <laughs> that's, that's right. I like that. I like that. He told me one time he was in Egypt. And the military came in while he was preaching and had rifles, and they walked up to him and said, you got to stop preaching. He said, I will not. I will share the gospel. And they said, no, you will not. And they started pointing the guns right at him. And he said, I, and he just kept preaching, and they kept pulling the triggers, and nothing would happen. He said, they put their guns down, sat down, and listened to the sermon and got born again that very night. Okay, I don't, wanna, I don't want that testimony. I like to share those testimonies. But it can happen. That's right. And so we're talking about being discipled and the importance of discipleship. And discipleship is not just learning about Christ. It's being equipped to serve Christ. And so in the ministry of reconciliation and reconciling them, but what we're reconciling them back is to the garden. That's the ultimate thing. 
there is a path back to the garden before the fall. And if you don't believe that, you have limited what Christ can do for you. That you can so die, Paul would not have been allowed to say in Galatians 2.20, no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. I've been crucified to Christ. No longer I live, but Christ. He would not be allowed to make that scripture had that not been true. So he had been crucified that no longer Paul lived, but Christ lived in him. He, he entered a place we call union, where he'd become so like Christ, he had so married like Christ, there was no difference between him and Christ. And that not that he was not without sin, because he had sin. We see that in Romans 7, things I don't want to do yet, I do. It's sin living in me. He realized he got, but he had finally found a way to crucify it. And when he couldn't get rid of it, he said God's grace was sufficient for him to make it. How many of y'all love that passage? When you've prayed and prayed for somebody to leave your life and they won't. Uh, I, it doesn't have to be somebody. It can be a thorn. That usually is somebody. But you may have something in your life and you've begged God to get rid of it. And he said, no, you got a little pride issue. We're going to leave it there. I want you to understand, thorns are for pride. That's what they're for. And you're trying to get rid of your thorns. And he says, I'm trying to get rid of your pride. Maybe if you get rid of your pride, we'll get rid of your thorns. <laughs> Y'all didn't like that one. but Because um, you want to get rid of a few folks, right? Okay. So when we're being equipped, we're getting back to that place where, Lord, everything's available to us. I want you to read every scripture. When you're reading the word, say, Lord, why can't I have that? Why am I not walking in that? When you see this miracle, or you see, like I was reading this week in Acts, so y'all reading with us, where his aprons and his handkerchiefs were, were healing the sick and causing demons to leave. I said, come on, Jesus. Can that happen to my handkerchief? Can that happen to my apron? That somebody takes it and that happens? Why not? Well, you're not Paul. I don't want to be Paul. I want to be who I'm supposed to be, but I want to say the same anointing that is in Christ is in me. The same anointing that Paul had is in us. He's all in all. Why not have that happen? Why not say, Lord, you know, let, use, use whatever I have for that purpose and to help somebody come back to Christ, to reconcile them through my life. And when I prophesy, if you watch how I prophesy, it's not that I do it on purpose. I'm always telling somebody their future, and I'm always telling them what they're called to do to help others. I'm not there to prophesy and how wonderful they are. And how flowery they are. And they're just they're God's best piece of furniture there is. That's not what I'm telling them. I'm telling them why you're here. You're here to help other people. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to hear how good they are. Or what, what, how beautiful they are. And, and you are beautiful. But the fact is you have a purpose. And it's to reconcile people back to Christ. It's to reconcile them that they have a hope to get back to the garden before the fall. Every, let me put it this way. Your life journey is to get back there, and wherever you f stop, if you die for whatever reason and you don't make it, when you get to heaven, you start working from that place forward. You understand? So if you got half your stuff dealt with while you were here, when you get to heaven, you start working on the other half. It's not over. You think, well, good, it's all done, I'm cleaned up. No, 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 no. If you don't learn it here, you have to learn it there. And that's why it's very clear that when you study the Word, as well as those who've had experiences, that there are placements in heaven that not everybody runs to the throne. Everybody sees the throne, but not everybody runs to it. Because if you don't have a, a robe of righteousness, you don't have access there. Because the glory will roast you. If you just have a garment of salvation, that's like a see-through nightgown. You know what I'm saying? That's not much. <laughs> it's covering something, but it's not covering it all, right? <laughs> and so guess what? You get to go to where we call paradise. The thief on the cross, right? Today you'll be in paradise. How many Sunday school classes did he go to? <laughs> he didn't know nothing. So he had to start at the very beginning. Only twice in Scripture do you see the word paradise. 
once is there, and the other time is in the church of Ephesus. They said, today you'll be in paradise. And the seven churches, I used to teach this, but the seven churches are a progression of a walk of a believer. And the first one is, you'll be with me in paradise, the church of Laodicea. The last one is, you'll be seated with me in heaven. And you'll see each one, you get a new name, you do all these different things. The seven, when it says the overcomers, to him who overcomes, and each of the seven church ages is a progression of a walk of a believer. You're saved. You all get to go to paradise. Thank you, Jesus. It's better than the alternative, right? But the fact is, if you are happy just to make it, you have missed why you've been put on earth. You are here to accelerate your walk and to be ministered, be reconciled to him fully so that you can have full access. I want to get, I want to be able to, I'm not there yet. I'm being honest with you. I had a dream and I showed y'all where the bride is. She's still got issues. And I know it was a representation of where I was too. And I want to make sure that, uh, you know, some of y'all are probably going to go past me in heaven. And you're going to say, where's Pastor Tim? I'm like, I'm back here. I'll catch up in a little bit. You know, I, I, one thing I've said about people been to the throne, I, I, I've, I've read multiple books and encounters of people been to heaven. I just, I got fascinated with that for a season. And I, I read everything I get my hands on. I listen to every testimony. The number one group of people that they see at the throne, for, it's, it's, it's almost like everybody I talk to or read about says the same thing. The number one group of people that are at the throne, the closest to Jesus, are usually women intercessors. Because they give up their life to lay on their face before the Lord. The Annas that stayed in the temple until Christ came. The Simeons who stayed in the temple until Christ came. Their purpose was to make sure that he came into the earth. Your purpose is to make sure he comes into the earth, into the venues and into the arenas where you are called to. And that kind of scares me because those people don't want platform. They don't want this. They, well, if they get it, amen. If they don't, it doesn't matter to them because their heart is to minister to the Lord. And ministering to the Lord gives you access to a greater place in heaven. I don't, mean, I don't hope that doesn't discourage you. I hope that encourages you. Yeah. Reese Howe's my champion on that. Remember Reese Howe? He was a preacher. His story was he was preaching. And in those days, you traveled with an intercessor, and the intercessor prayed for you in the basement while you preached. And then in the middle of his journey, the Lord says, I want you to swap places. I want your intercessor to be the speaker, and I want you to be the intercessor. And he said, excuse me, <laughs> I have newsletters that go out. I have a big web list. I have people that follow me, and now you want me to go underground? And the Lord said, yep, that's it. And when Reese took his call, he realized it was the greater call for him. And he's one of the greatest intercessors of anybody we know. I want to say, this is, this is a testimony. I, I believe it's true because it, uh, Gwen Shaw shares it. Uh, she used to run the End Times Handmaidens and Servants. She's gone on to be with the Lord. But she had an intercessor from England who, uh, um, uh, powerful, anyway, she had an encounter. She was taken to hell, and she was in hell, and Jesus was with her, and she came across one of these cells, and she saw Adolf Hitler. And he knew she was from England. And, and uh, he pointed to her, he says, that man, that man, Reese Howe, he cost me England. And what it was a statement was, Reese Howe interceded against Germany during the war. And his intercession, according to Hitler in hell, was that his intercession kept him from overtaking a nation. So your little prayer for Shreesville can save a city. Right? You can do that. Wouldn't that be awesome? Somebody from Shreveport has an encounter in hell, and they go, oh, Tammy Lark, she's the reason I couldn't take Shreveport. Why not? I, I, when I was learning deliverance, I, I was working with some Satanists and not working with them, against them, but I, I, was, <laughs> I was doing deliverance on them, and I was really struggling, and I contacted this lady I heard on Sid Roth. She was a high priestess, Satanist. And she got born again, and, and she told me a story. Uh, and, and they lived in the Birmingham, Alabama area. Her coven did. 
And they wanted to build a stronghold around Birmingham. And so they do what they call a triangle. They put covens in three different areas and they, they try to lock in a stronghold, a principality over a city so the city can't operate in its prophetic purpose. So they were fasting and praying to Satan in order to build a stronghold. And they were working hard at it, she said, for a long time, months and almost years, trying to build this stronghold. And there was a problem. There was one church that was keeping them from building their stronghold. It was a deliverance church. Bill French was a pastor at that time of this church in Birmingham. And he's, I called him later. He helped me on deliverance as well. He helped mentor me in deliverance. Anyway, and so she said she was the high priestess of her coven, and she says, that's it. We're taking that man out. We're taking that church out. So they targeted the church. And I want you to understand that. If a church is not under warfare, they're not affecting a community. And the fact that you get to go, you're privileged to go here, tells you that you're going to be under warfare. <laughs> and so it's, it's, a, it's a marker not that you're good. It means that you're taking something. You're going after something. And so she said that was it. She'd had it. She says, I'm sending people in. So she started sending witches into the church. Get them involved. You know, get them engaged. Let them join the, the intercessory team. Let them join the worship team. Let them join the Sunday school classes. Get them in there. The only problem she was having was they wouldn't come back. <laughs> because this dude was so powerful. After they were in there a while, he'd spot them as witches and get them delivered and get them born again, reconciling them to Christ. And she said one by one she lost every witch she had in her coven. And she said, that's it, I'm going in. And so she decided on her own volition that she was going in. She said she went in the first meeting, and what he would do, Brother Bill would do, his name, Bill French is his name, he, he would spot you, and because a lot of witches like to get in prayer lines. They love to get in prayer lines because they want to feel the power. They don't care whether it's from heaven or hell. They want power. So they love to get in prayer lines. So she got in a prayer line because she wanted to cause the demons on her to get on the pastor. That's what she wanted. So he sat her down, and he said he bound her hands in the spirit to the chair. So she's like sitting there like this. He said, raise your hand, and then she binds it, and she can't let go of her hands. They're like stuck to the chair. And she starts, he starts calling her out, you're a witch, da, da, da. He starts calling her out, starts casting, the, trying to cast the demons out. She goes crazy, she said. She picks up her chair and runs around the room. She's like just running around the room because she wanted to get out of there. She said she got to her room. She, got, she left the meeting, got to her, her apartment, and the demon said to her, don't you ever take us back to a place like that. <laughs> How many demons feel comfortable at your house? Maybe they're on that tube up there. Maybe that's their access point. Where's their access point? Where do you let them hang out in your house? This is not even in my notes. This is good stuff, all right? <laughs> so, so, so here's the thing. And so she just got wrecked. And then the Lord appeared to her and just said to her, why are you persecuting me? Just like Paul, same encounter. Why are you in per why? And she, she got born again. And now she became one of the, she still is, a strong person of setting people free out of the occult, pulling them out of Satanism and setting them free because she got reconciled, so now she has a ministry of reconciliation to the very people she was. We had them here. I was clueless. I, I, one, of the, one of the witches we delivered, it, it wasn't until she said to me, she freaked out one service. We were having all the dancers, and I used to let anybody dance, wave any flag. You could do whatever you wanted here. I was like, freedom, you know, and she looked. She's one time she was shaking in service. She goes, what's wrong? She says, that woman, she's in my coven. And she'd been dancing with us for months. Mr. Discerner here had no clue. Because <laughs> I, I, I was trying to be non-religious, and I realized you have to pastor a move of God. you got to guard the people because wolves will come in among them. And then you get called controlling. He's a controlling pastor. He wouldn't let me do this and this and this. Well, maybe because we saw the demons in you. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> and we didn't want to manifest in here. Maybe we're going to give grace to you until you got free. And then let you manifest what God has inside of you. Ooh, the Holy Spirit came in on that one. That's a big one. And you need to make sure that's around your life. People that you're allowed. There were times in our family that we didn't let our kids be around certain members of our family. And we came under attack for that because, look, we're family. You can't keep that from us. And our point was we're not going to interject our children in that environment. And we, we, in some of our family, it made them change because they recognized that we saw what was in them and we weren't going to allow it. And so they recognized the only way they could be near us was if they changed their lifestyle. Let that be the convictor. Let, the Holy, let your standard be the convictor. Without a standard, nobody thinks they're doing wrong. When there's no law, everybody's lawless. So you become the law in the spirit. That's a standard. I'm not going to allow that. Well, I guess maybe I'm wrong. And they have to think about that. I feel like the Jeopardy music should come in here right now. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay. Um, <laughs> where, where should we close this out? Okay, good. Thank you, sister. Um, we talked about discipleship, equipping. You need, first of all, the Father needs to equip you. Now, we are teaching you how to get to the Father. We are giving you a path to the Father, but we are not the discipler. We can only give you a portion because we're not fully reconciled yet. We're not fully sanctified yet. We're working on our sanctification. Please take what we've been sanctified in but beyond that, get the rest from the Father. Imitate us as we imitate Christ. Don't imitate us what we don't imitate as Christ. Okay? There's a grace there for that, but don't be enamored by somebody because they're so gifted. Recognize, look, I've been in many green rooms and back rooms with leaders, top leaders, and you'd be surprised at the issues they're struggling with. They can get out here and put on a show. But the fact, when we get back in that back room, they have a bunch of issues. And sometimes I wonder why God allows them to be out there. I went to a, there was a guy named uh, Mike Warnke. You have to be old enough to remember this dude. He was a comedian years ago. And I went to, he, I think he said he was a former Satanist, didn't he? I think is what he said he was. And went to a municipal auditorium, and I saw hundreds of people get born again while he ministered after he did his concert. It wasn't long after that we found out he was in open sin, wasn't even born again, nothing. And I had, for me as a young Christian, I said, wait a minute. I saw people go forward and get saved. How can that happen? And I was talking to a minister friend of mine. He says, because the word is in void. It accomplishes what it set out to do. Even if a donkey speaks it, it still has the power of God in it. And so I had to learn that. So it taught me some as a young believer not to be enamored by the gift, but always be enamored by the gift giver, which is Christ, right, in us as he flows through us. That's, that's the passion that we have to have. So he is your discipler. And last week we talked about there, were, there are certain people in Scripture that had to be discipled by the Father because there was nobody there to disciple. And there are times that you've gone through a season that there's nobody to disciple you. When, I, when I, I stayed in the ministry, when we were first here, the church was dying. It was going through a whole process, and Susan and I were still here, and everybody was leaving and joining other churches, and it was just massive exodus, and, and all our friends were leaving, and I said, Lord, can we leave? <laughs> you know, and the Lord said, no, you have to stay. And I said, that's not fair. This place is dead. And he said, no, you stay. And so we stayed, and I didn't get mad. I didn't stay there with an attitude. I said, Lord, where, I'm going to find you wherever you are here. Wherever you are, I'm going to find you. If it's one meeting for five minutes, there it is. My favorite time was when sometimes the leaders say he'd let somebody else preach and the anointing would come. You know, and that was an important meeting because I got something out. Books, tapes, we called CDs. I'll say CDs. Uh, tapes back then. Uh, books, you know, Christian television. I, that was my mentor because I didn't have anybody mentoring because there was nobody to disciple, because the place was dead. And yet God said, I'm going to resurrect it. So you stay for resurrections. So sometimes you get put in a situation that's dead because God wants to see a resurrection. And those that get to stay around get to be a part of the resurrection. 
I'm sitting here because I have, <laughs> me and Susan were the two that stayed around. <laughs> you understand? I, I believe I wasn't supposed to be the person. I believe there was others. I think there always is. I think most of the calls we have many times are somebody else has already been asked to do it. Catherine Coleman says she was the fifth person to be asked to do her ministry. Fifth. And she had one of the strongest healing ministries the world has ever seen. It's all about, hear my Lord, send me. So Moses was. Elijah was. David was. David didn't. Who's going who's gonna to disciple you to be a king that's pure? Well, you read the history of the kings of Israel. <laughs> I mean, every one of them's messed up. So the only one that could the disciple him was the father. So whatever you lack in somebody over you, the father can teach you. Well, I, and I have people all the time, Pastor, I just want you to disciple. I want you to disciple me. I, and I appreciate that, and I enjoy that. I remember one minister said, this one guy, I kept coming to him, Pastor, I need you, I need you to disciple me. I need you to disciple me. I just need to be a disciple. I want to be discipled. I want to walk in what you're walking in. He said, oh, good. And he said one Saturday, he said, you know, I'll tell you what, bro. He said, this Saturday, I'm working in the yard all day. I've bought a bunch of plants and dirt, fertilizer. We can talk all day long. Why don't you come and help me? No, I want to be discipled. And he said, well, we can disciple. And you can help me plant some flowers. You can help me work in my yard. Said, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want to come to your office. I want you to, I want you to take me on your trips. I want all these different things. No. And he said, I tell you what, you can learn a lot while you're working in the yard. It's a parable, right? You're preparing the ground. You're doing all those things. It'd be a whole discipleship program. But that spoke to the heart of the young man. His heart wasn't to be disciples. His heart to be right here. The most three foot by three foot real estate, the most fought after real estate in the world, right here. Everybody fights for this real estate. They think it's something wonderful. Scott, Pastor Scott said Sunday, double, double battle for those who are in this spot. Okay? Don't envy it. I promise you. It's not what you think it is. It's not. I, but I, I'd like to you get up here and let you go through some stuff. Because what you don't, what you say and you don't do, you get to do. <laughs> Preaching from theory is a big mistake. Because God said, well, that was good. That was good. Let's take you through what you just preached. <laughs> yeah. well, hey, I Sunday morning, I prophesied a couple weeks ago, Psalm 91. No deadly thing will harm us, you know, the shadow of the rain. That after that evening, I'm in the closet because I got a tornado warning coming to my house. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, so I wrote the staff, Psalm 91, Psalm 91. I said, let's all pray. I had a lot more confidence in there on Sunday than I did in my little closet right there, right? Hello? How many of y'all were in your closets with us, right? I had another one last week, right? I'm like, y'all... And I go home, my family's from Indiana, and I said, what do y'all do in tornadoes? Because they have basements. I, I go, do you, they go, do you go to your basement? I said, we have no basement. We, we dig five feet. We got water, you know. <laughs> we, we, we go in a closet. A closet? I said, yeah, that's it, man. Closet, Psalm 91. I just put a, why don't y'all put that above that door, your closet, Psalm 91. All right, that's where we are. <laughs> Okay, so, so you have that, the Father, disciples. But then, you know, what's the beauty of somebody who gets discipled by the Father? They become one of the best disciplers because they have heard from the Father directly. And every era you've gotten discipled by the Father, you're going to have a greater impartation in. Because when he's taught you, you can impart it. And that's what, Mo that's what Moses did for Joshua. He taught him. Elisha hung around Elijah. You know, the beauty of Elisha, Elisha discipled, I mean, Elijah discipled Elisha. It says that Elisha poured water over the hands of Elijah. That's an act of service. You understand that? He followed Elijah everywhere he went. He wasn't like a Bible college student just who came out to watch. It just observe. He was committed. Is there anything I can do for you? You want me to wash your feet? You want to wash your hands? Do you need anything? Do you need anything? He was always, because he knew the more he served the prophet, the more he'd learn from the prophet. 
He didn't serve him so he could have position. He served him so he could learn. Because when you serve others, you get to watch what they do, and you can learn from what they do, and you can do what they do, but in a greater measure. Because Elisha did much more than Elijah. Joshua did much more than Moses. You understand? It's always exponential growth when you get discipled by somebody who's been discipled by the Father. And David, you know, he, what do they say of Jesus? Son of David. They called him. Jesus, in a sense, when he was a little boy, was learning how to be a king by reading about King David. So he discipled by the scripture of what King David did, what King David did right. Not the Bathsheba thing, thank goodness, right? You don't do the bad stuff. Now, I wish our children would have figured that out, but they didn't. And we talked about that before. Your kids hone in on your shortcomings just so you can have a mirror. That's the only reason that happens. So you can watch what you look like. <laughs> Hello. Does any parents want to come to testify? Right? Okay. And kids, if you've done that to your, for your parents, you're mirroring them, that's because you've honed in on their weakness, not their strengths. So you got your own issues, all right? So we'll go with that. All right, here we go. Um, and then Paul, he discipled Timothy. And I love that, that, that journey of where he discipled Timothy because Timothy had a lot of issues, which I relate to. But, you know, he, Timothy was always scared. He was timid. He didn't think his gift was good enough. Paul, he was forgetting his prophecies, and yet Paul didn't give up on him. He kept pushing him, and there was a later day when we heard Timothy, the apostle. So your shortcomings don't determine your future. It's a matter of submitting to those who are speaking into your life. And if you'll do that, look, anybody, when you submit to somebody, a leader or whoever, and their goal is to make them serve you, you to serve them, I should say, then that's, that's not the right model. When they're submitting to you, it's the thing that, that you want is you want to help them become what they're supposed to be. And a true submission is you, this person has a mission, and you come under it, sub below. You come underneath somebody else's mission, so you uphold their mission. Well, the Bible also says submit one to another. So even the, the, submit, the one who's being submitted to also comes under somebody else's mission, which I, we do here in our leadership. We look for your gifts. We look for your callings. We try to help you. We come under your mission and help hold you up to get where you're supposed to be. That's our goal. And many churches, many ministries, are. it's all about serving the leadership. And that's not what it's about. You do that, but you don't do it for the reasons that, that, that they're allowing that to happen. You do it so that you can learn. And that's what discipleship is. That's what it means to be discipled, to be equipped to do that. So there, there are those ways to be, become discipled. Number one way, and I'm, I'm going to stop right here. The number one way, 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remember the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it's in you also. So one of the ways you're discipled is generationally. Now, you may not have a family that did that, but you go to other generations and be discipled. If you're young, go find a grandmother, a Lois, a Charlotte, or you know, or somebody like that that's in this room. I'm not saying because I think you're the oldest, Charlotte. I'm just saying we find, we just find a grandmother that's out there, and we do that. And, and like, you know, a lot of young people, they think, well, they don't know anything. They know more than you know. We, let me say this to you. An older person has been in the kingdom a long time. They've forgotten more than you've ever learned. That's a Dutch sheet statement, not mine. So if you didn't like it, go, go dutchsheets.com. You can write him right there, right? You can do that. Okay. And so then you got a grandmother, another generation, a mother. So you got three generations. I had a dream about a 3G anointing, three-generation anointing. It's very critical that we tap into all generations. Even also, grandma can still learn something from grandbaby. And I, I always I tell this one time, me and Susan were having an a intense moment of fellowship and uh, in front of Isaac Paul, and he was in his high chair. He was two. I remember. I remember exactly where he was sitting. And, and you know, she just didn't see it right. And, um, no, I, we were getting pretty intense. Remember this, babe? And so 
little Isaac Paul sitting in his little chair, eating his little Gerber food, whatever he was doing, because we forgot he was there. Hello? And literally, he almost sat up in his chair, and he said, stop it. And it was like an adult. I mean, he spoke like an adult. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> that was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and I better go out of here. <laughs> and no, understand. I knew the Holy Spirit took that little boy, put a man's voice in him, and made him prophesy to us to stop that nonsense. So I learned something from a two-year-old. You understand? I got discipled by a two-year-old. So don't think you got it all because you're granny or grandpa. Man, the Holy Ghost is in this room. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3.15, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So you have three generation anointing, and you have the Scriptures. So that tells you you're going to be discipled by others, you're going to be discipled generationally, and the Word of God is going to disciple you. That's what we try to do. That's why we have all this school. That's why we do the things around here. That's why we have Wednesday nights like this. We're trying to disciple you, give you the tool belt and things in your tool belt so you can go defeat the works of Satan, that you can become what God's called you to be. Okay, that's enough. Let's stand up. All right, if y'all keep coming, we're going to keep doing this. Thank you, Lord. And y'all are faithful. Those people at home that just chose not to come, I'm not going to rebuke them. But, but when you start manifesting and they're not, they're going to get jealous, okay? So you start manifesting the reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, and, and, and just have a heart. You know, some of you, I know you can't come. If you're here watching by stream, God bless you. Just don't eat popcorn while I'm preaching, all right? It's not a movie, all right? So, <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right. Now, look, the Holy Spirit's here. I'm telling you, the teacher is in the room. The King of Kings, the one who can teach you and lead you into all truth, the Holy Spirit is in this room. I've taught you what I could. Let the Holy Spirit finish and fill in every gap that it can apply to your life. Any man that thinks he can teach you everything is a fool. The Holy Spirit has to be the teacher who leads us into all truth. So, Lord, I ask you to teach us daily the ministry of reconciliation. That, Lord, thank you that old things have passed away and all things have become new. Now I see the world in a new way. Now I have a new set of standards. Now I have a new way of walking my life out. Thank you for the newness. Now, give me the strength to go through my process of sanctification. That, Lord, that I allow you to work on my heart, and each one of us to work on our hearts, so much so that what is in us that's not you would be rooted out so that more of you would have manifestation in our lives. We repent for not manifesting as sons and daughters of God. Well, Lord, we want our light to so shine that all the world will see that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, just like we started with tonight. I pray peace upon everybody here tonight. Lord, dreams, visions, encounters. Lord, I pray for that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, as they lay their heads on their pillow tonight, that, Lord, they would begin to have encounters and begin to say, Lord, what is in me? Now, Father, give us the grace also to hear the groans of the hurting, the groans of the lost. Lord, let us have compassion for those that are in a place that, Lord, they're separated from you. And that, Lord, we have the answer to bridge them back to you, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I pray that it would manifest more in the days ahead than it ever has before. I call for the spirit of evangelism to fall upon us, Lord, that we would know who to go to. I want to say that to you. You need to know who to go to. I'm not saying don't witness just raw. I'm not, that does work sometimes. But Jesus would tell the disciples where to go. Remember that? He would say, don't go to the Gentiles. It's not the time for that. Go to the house of Israel. That sounds negative, doesn't it? But what it was, they were Jews who had issues with the Gentiles. That wasn't going to work. <laughs> so Jesus knew who needed to go to the Gentiles. So he waits for a Gentile to get saved and let him be the light to the Gentiles. Cornelius wins other Gentiles to the Lord. Acts chapter 10. So here we go. 
So, Father, send us where we're supposed to go. Lord, divine appointments, encounters with the people we're supposed to encounter, Lord, so that that when our light shows up, Lord, the groaning of theirs connects with our light, and we minister the spirit of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, and tell the story of the reconciliation of our own lives and that they too can be reconciled to you. Lord, from children to adults to seniors to everybody, the opportunity to come to know you. I pray for a harvest now of that salvation in our cities, Father, in this region, God. We call it in right now. Okay. Ooh, la, la, la. I kept hearing the Lord says, tell my people tonight they're a formidable force. They're a formidable force as they go out in me. And I want you to understand that you are formidable to the enemy. The enemy, the worst thing you can do is manifest your light to the enemy because the enemy knows if you manifest, he's in trouble. So, Lord, we let our light so shine that the whole world, let us be like the city, the light set on the hill that all can see us, Father, for what you've put in us, Father. We thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name.